Welcome to Integrate Yourself, everybody. I'm your host, Allison Palo, and you can find me at pureenergypdx.com. Today, I am here with one of the most special guests. Her name is Laura Erica, and she is a linguistic, evolutionary, and educational entertainer. She's also the creator of Word Magic, Word Magic Global, wordplay that unravels mass hypnosis and elevates the frequency of consciousness. Now, if you happen to be wondering what what uh, what good is wordplay at a time like this, please stay tuned for for Laurel's. Word magic is a mind-bending, paradigm-shifting reintroduction to the English language that brings to light the hidden philosophy in puns, anagrams, and the symbols of the alphabet. Most people discover Laurel's work through her global YouTube video, The Secret Spells of the English, English Language, um, which I watched and I thought was amazing. Um, in our conversation today, she will reveal more secret spells with which we write our own life sentences, as well as some of the sacred path words that point toward our liberation. Through her writing, speaking, and teaching, Laurel's, uh, Laurel shows in verse and prose how young and old around the globe can collectively creativ- creativ- creatively and quite rapidly take command of the Eng- English language and upgrade it to support our essential evolutionary leap from humankind to human kindness. By so doing, she believes we can turn the tide on the global sea of consciousness to lift lift us all to a higher ground. For as alternative medicine activist and best-selling author, Lynn McTaggart has pointed out what really has to change more than anything else is how people view the world and their place in it. Similarly, scientist and best-selling author Greg Braden has said, we need a new neutral, uh, neutral vocabulary that helps us embrace the deep truths of our existence as human to human without the judgments. I believe it gives us the evolutionary edge that we've never had. That's very true. Not just to survive, but to transcend and thrive in the new world that's emerging. Laurel's word magic reveals why this is so necessary and how readily we can accomplish it together. And, oh man, I could not agree more. This is the most important thing, especially what we in, in what we've been dealing with this past year and a half. We have seen in real time how words can affect uh, everybody's emotions and intentions and actions uh, just by just by uh, with words basically I mean I've seen it people react so differently from day to day based on what's on the news so we're gonna get into that and and the magic behind that too today as well as so much more so thank you so much Laurel for coming on the show and talking with me about this I'm so excited uh, to talk to you today well, me too. And just as your work is about tuning up the human instrument, body, mind, and spirit, so that the highest frequencies of divine light, love, intelligence can embody in us and flow through us, the language is a body of information. And it is the lens through which we view the world. And there's a whole uh, other language that is speaking to us and through us through puns, words that have the same sound and different meaning, and through the symbols of the alphabet. And we are usually unaware of this multi-layer communication, how it influences our worldview, how it drives our actions, and how we are affirming it each time we speak. So by playing with words in the really fun and easy way that I like to share with people, we can awaken 
to a greater degree to be able to use the language in a positive, creative fashion instead of haphazardly and then wonder at the challenges we're facing and what they might have to do with what we said the other day. <laughs> right, absolutely, because we are in, re we're creating a reality with our words w without really realizing it, right? Yes, yeah. absolutely. And I'm learning about this all the time myself and getting more and more refined in my awareness. And for me, it all started with wordplay. And I think that's the entryway for anybody. Uh, and wordplay is one of the most enjoyable and informing uh, play, kinds of play that people have done in all eras, all cultures, and at all ages. And this is a way of, or what I show is a way of using it for greater awakening and elevation of consciousness. I agree. It's very, very powerful. And I want to also say that I had the pleasure and the honor of meeting you in person and we spent the whole day together and talked and took a hike together and had lunch and it was a full day of synchronicities. I mean, it just was incredible. Um, and it was, it was kind of like time stopped a little bit too. And, and it was, we had a, a blast and, um, and it, and, and as you would walk by somebody, you would, use your words and your energy and they would just light up and I was sitting there witnessing that like my god like this is there's a lot of truth to this stuff you know um and so uh I would love 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 for you to and first I want to also just uh say you know I've been also following your stuff for a while I listened to you on a few podcasts I, and Paul Check connected us. And even before that, I was thinking about you because I was like, I need to get Laurel on my show. I heard you on another podcast. And um, and so that led me also, after spending the day with you, to sign up for your writing, your creative writing class, Sacred Rights, which is a wonderful class, meeting the best people. What a great group of people. And so I've really Fairly. been enjoying that. So um, just to give my audience a little bit of a, a, a background in you and I's relationship. And then I would love for you to share how you got into this. Because I remember you saying that this is something that came to you in early childhood. You were really curious about words, right? Yes, uh, I was. Um, I mean, I can tell this story if you like. <laughs> I would love um, to hear it. Yeah. Thank you. So just... Um, just to share that in the 90s, I wrote what I call my fairyography, and it's my metaphoric, allegoric autobiography as an interdimensional elemental being who goes through the looking glass into the mundane plane, this dimension, and has to deconstruct the language to find her way back home again. So it was funny, um, I did a podcast a few months ago, I think the show is called Down the Rabbit Hole or something like that. And I really wanted to learn something new about my own work um, in the process. And I realized at that time that just as in Alice through the looking glass, she was in pursuit of a white rabbit my journey with the English language began in pursuit of a bat. And oh. it, it's, I, I was probably, well, and sometimes I ask people, again, prefacing this further, how many, how many tried digging a hole to China in their backyard Me? as a child? <laughs> right? I totally did that. Oh, my God. It was... Uh, well, I, I loved the idea. I was like, can I do this? I mean, is this true? <laughs> I, I know. And, and so many people have. And then if I'm presenting live, I'll say how many people succeeded. And a, a few jokers will say that they did. And I will explain that I actually did tunnel my way through the English language. And when I came out the other end, I was in China. And wow. so this is the story, a delivery, oh gosh, there's always so many digressions. 
but uh, in a book by J Dr. James Hillman, I think it's, I don't know if it's your soul's code, something like that. He looks at certain prominent people and reviews their childhood for foreshadowings of the work they would be doing in the world. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so when I was two or three years old, my father, who was a, a painter, an artist, who and loved to listen to classical music while he worked, he ordered a Magnavox monaural sound system. And this is like 1948. And so this and so that's so perfect because I'm all about the sound of words. So here was this sound system, and the person who delivered it unpacked the box to set it up and I came in as a toddler to see what he was doing. And he told me that when he opened the box, a bat had flown out of it and out through the window and landed in a tree in the backyard. And of course he was making that up, but I ran outside and stood be in front of the little scrawny tree in uh, the desert town where we lived expecting to see a bat hanging from it and at a certain point i realized i was expecting to see a baseball bat hanging from it and it was in my memory that moment when i had the startling realization that words that had no apparent relationship to each other might share the same sound mm -hmm. and it's like what is that about and so I went in pursuit of the bat through a process a friend of mine described through a slip of the tongue as echolocution. <laughs> it was indeed that putting together words that have the same sound and no apparent relationship to each other and looking to see how they might be connected. Wow. So I tunneled through the English language with echolocution, finding all sorts of bizarre puns. And in my fairyography, uh, my character named Philomela Nightingale, and Philomela is the literary term for the nightingale, she says, I will give you some examples. These are favorite ones of mine. The fact that praying sounds so savage, yet <laughs> yes. it also sounds divine. Right. Or how about the way the prophet has become our bottom line? Oh, right. Now add worship or worship, parish yeah. or perish. <laughs> and you'll soon understand why the world's so nightmarish. So putting together words and early on seeing that my grandmother had a friend named Frank Level. And I would say, oh, Frank Level spelled L-E-V-E-L, -E -E both frontward and backward. <laughs> and that, that kind of word is a palindrome. And my father, who would make his own frames and would use a, a carpenter's level, and I would see how the level was balanced with a little bubble in the center. And I saw how the word level is a level word. And it's L-E-V, which is like a fulcrum, oh, E-L, right. oh, so uh, in both directions. And, and I saw parallel has three parallel lines. And, and the word opposite is spelled O-P-P-O-S-I-T-E. So at the time that I started playing with words, the idea that homonyms, words with the same sound and different meanings, might be even more closely related than synonyms, which are different words describing the same thing, was considered nonsense. And puns were considered a very low form of humor. Mm -hmm. And in my fairyography, um, she says that because she felt like the lowest form of human, she felt more akin to homonyms than hominins, which are humans, <laughs> since <laughs> puns are similarly right. denigrated as the lowest form of humor. So, um, gosh, maybe 10 years ago, 
I was at the Pacific Asia Museum in Pasadena and I saw a bat puppet. And since bat was that first pun and I was going to be sharing some word magic in a classroom with kids, I thought about spending the money to buy it. And I, but I figured, well, let me see the exhibition and see how that purchase lands with me. So when I was looking at the exhibition, the only thing I remember from it was a little card, explana uh, explanatory card in one of the exhibits that says in uh, the Taoist philosophy, the bat is the symbol for happiness because oh. in Chinese, the word bat is pronounced fu and the word for happiness is also fu. And playing with wow. words has been my happiness throughout the many arduous challenges in my life. It's been my escape and has been very illuminating. And I had an opportunity to go to China, oh. um, find discovering that here's a culture that doesn't disregard puns as foolish fun, but thinks of it as powerful synchronicities with philosophic mm. implications. And so uh, in China on a tour, there was a place with a, a huge golden statue of Buddha. And I had, was a, a Buddhist at the time. And the guide said, this is the land of called the land of a thousand buddhas and also the land because there were so many statues and also the land of happiness and he explains because in chinese the word for happiness is fu and the word for um buddha is fu <laughs> so so of course i had by that time purchased the bat puppet and my grandchildren know and love him as Fu, the Buddha bat of happiness. Oh my so that's how I got started. <laughs> oh, wow. Yes, that's a that's an incredible story. And I, I love <clears throat> I love when you mentioned at the beginning how um you made a reference to a book that I can't remember the title of, but I, I wrote about this in my book that I have coming out about how uh and this this actually just it, it occurred to me that whatever we're really interested in as kids, the, the passions, the desires, the things we move toward are really what we, we end up, you know, really being, uh, wanting and, and still desiring as adults. But sometimes we forget along the way because we get into yes. adult life. Right. So, um, my, my take on it is if you're, if you lost your, your creativity, so to speak, then, you can just look back at what you're interested in when you were a child and, and see if you can reconnect with it that way, right? Yes, absolutely. And yeah. um, make believe is an interesting phrase <laughs> because there's such coercion to make people believe certain things and because <laughs> everything is basically all made up anyway. So I think some of us or many of us are starting to get more stimulus checks. And of course <laughs> the government just prints money. It now, or it's electronic money and it now has power like Tinkerbell only if there's enough people believing in it. Right, right, yeah. At, at, and so children pretend and I look at the word pretend as a pretendency mm. that you make believe something uh, that is a pretendency for you. I mean, I played teacher as a child mm. and and parenthetically, when we were studying the explorers in school, they were called explorers, not exploiters, but that's actually what they were. <laughs> and I was very disappointed to learn that all the continents had already been discovered because I wanted to be an explorer. So now I like to joke that they left the consonants for me. <laughs> and, <laughs> and the word consonants, which are what all but 21 letters of the alphabet are consonants, but consonants also means harmony, resonance, uh, yeah. and peace. 
So in terms of pretending, most children pretend that they are superheroes Mm -hmm. or fairy princesses, that they have extraordinary capabilities. And I think that these archetypes of superhero or fairy princess is the closest they can come in this culture on self of self transcending archetypes that match what we still have some sense of when we're very young, which is our spiritual capacities. Mm, And Dr. Joe Dispenza talks today about becoming supernatural and Greg Braden as well. And don't accept a computer chip to give you extraordinary abilities because this is the time for us to recognize that we have so much more within us than what we have made believe (laughs) Uh, we do. We have such a diminished sense of ourselves. And uh, in terms of many disbelieving fairies, you just have to be in a low flying airplane coming in for a landing to see that we live in a tiny toy town. And <laughs> it's perspective, isn't it? <laughs> it is. So if, if we're this teeny with these outsized mm-hmm. emotions, how much more so is, um, uh, you know, how there are little tiny elementals who help keep things in harmony in nature. And lastly, and then I will give you back (laughs) that's okay (laughs) i love this this is a really great perspective because yeah why wouldn't that exist you know of course i mean yeah i'm with that well in in terms of adult life adult is an idiot a d o l t (laughs) (laughs) well that is i can i can totally believe that that to be true that sounds like we we do become we don't we we lose a lot of our common sense as when we become adults you know like adulting and all that i feel like yeah uh, and we become adulterated (laughs) and (laughs) and to get there we have to go through that period of time known as adult essence that's when your essence gets all addled and you forget you know who am I? Why am I here? What did I come for? And we, we're in touch with that as little ones. We're, we're, yes. We have access to infinite intelligence. There are windows that are open. I have a friend, Risa Brown, who is a, I met in the most synchronistic way of anyone I've ever met. And she is a homeschooling genius. And with, with the, the approach she shares, children become uh, Renaissance geniuses capable of excelling in university courses at 10, 11, 12, and etc. cetera. Uh, so the call to brilliance.com is one of her websites and passion oriented education. So yeah, there's so much more within us and the language dumbs us down. Absolutely. I have um, a niece and a nephew, uh, actually, two nephews and a niece that are, have been uh, are doing the unschool thing is what they call it <clears throat> where they it's more of a, a child-led <clears throat> educational uh, approach and so they they wherever the child is, whatever the child is interested in learning about or wherever they are in that moment that's what you that's what you teach or that's what you that's what you learn and they and they you know get curious about it and they you know everything a child does anyway like you you want to you know study it and look at it and do all these different things to it and and figure it out you know it's that's the process of our curiosity right we get curious about something then we really want to learn about it and so to me that curiosity has to be there in order for the learning process to really work for you you know and so much of public school is it does not even evoke curiosity in the, in the child it actually is more in the other direction where it's, it's forcing the child to, to do, to learn everything everybody else is learning when really the reality of it is that we all have things, we, different things here we want to learn, you know, and at a certain, a certain pace as well. So if that's, if that is individual to that person, that specific thing they're here to learn, then why are we putting everybody in this classroom and forcing them to learn the same stuff that nobody wants to learn? Like I've never heard 
I've heard that many people really say they love school, like not very many people, you know, and so um, if any, <laughs> and, you know, so I, I, don't, I just don't think it works. And, and it, but the going back to what I was talking about earlier with my nieces and my niece and my nephews, they have done the unschooling uh, thing for some time. And, and uh, my ne- one of my nephews is really young. He's five and the other nephew's older and, and my niece is in her teens now. And they are some of the most, some of the smartest kids I know. They are, in, I mean, aside from my own kids are smart too. But they just, they have a, they have a sense of creativity that you don't get when you go to public school. There's just a different, they just, they have a different perspective. They have a really, really uh, good sense of self, which I was impressed with. Like they, they're very self-assured people and at such a young age. And so um, I think that's really valuable, but so many kids lose that when they go through the public school system. Well, that is so true. And there is, I mean, it's so absurd. In my fairyography, she says, I was born in upside down town to the king and queen of backward land. And it's so backward, this culture. And it's so, um, it's such a reversal. It's like so many of the values mirror truth but in opposition. So for instance, evolution is an impulse within us all and progress is its worldly counterpart. But often people step aside for progress as they watch it destroy what had meaning and value, including their communities. And Children are the most precious resource of any culture, yet they are not invested in and they are not uh, by the culture because they're not looking for individuality. The, The word identity, which we think of perhaps as sacred and very individual is almost identical to the word identical. So you have people who grow up with identical identities. They let go of their uniqueness. Right. And in terms of education, um, as they say, what is it? It's, uh, I forget what the little phrase is, something, you know, that that there is some good that comes even of the darkest things. So COVID has... Uh, liberated many children from the compulsory education system. And my granddaughter at the age of six was already successfully bored of education. Yeah. So the self, <laughs> and see, they don't even lie. Ab- <laughs> well, and they don't even lie about it. The yeah. directors proclaim that they are the board of education. And if they succeed, then children will leave school board of education. (laughs) Whereas, whereas every growing thing has natural curiosity that makes them lifelong learners if they're not board of education. And in terms of lessons, no growing being wants anything that lessens them. (laughs) And and children, eyes are the windows to the soul, and and the pupil is at the center of the eye, so it's so essential, and we call children pupils, and yet we want them all to see the same way, so they will say see to whatever the agenda is, S-I, so I mean, we're constantly being echoed and reflected. And it's not in the Bible, it says the handwriting was on the wall. Well, now the handwriting is all over the language, (laughs) but we have been deaf to our definitions. Uh, And we've been told to watch what we say instead of listen. And so we're kind of dumbfounded. We're not of sound mind for the most part, because we're not listening to what was that echo? (laughs) You know, and this is so obvious too, right? It's so obvious, but yet it's not it's not because people aren't paying attention to it um, well, sherlock holmes 
And <laughs> the world is filled with obvious things that nobody happens to notice. Oh, that's so, ah, oh, that's very true. Very true. Well, and oh, the yeah. word obvious is almost <laughs> identical to the word oblivious. The only difference between them is yes. L-I, a lie right there at the center. Oh my goodness. Ah, oh, that is so profound. <laughs> <laughs> And so simple and accessible. Yes. And so it sounds like what we're saying, Laurel, is that uh, creativity uh, comes from curiosity. Would you agree with that? Or do you think it comes from Absolutely. another place? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Because when we're curious, we're going outside beyond the known. And we're opening up to the unknown and to possibilities. And so in spiritual traditions, beginner's mind is really um, encouraged so that we're always open to possibilities. And with our curiosity, we open up to be informed from a higher dimension than this little toy town that is <laughs> uh, that is in an envelope that we call the atmost fear. <laughs> <laughs> and and it is what is it? well it's a very it's like we talk about a reel of film but there's also the film of the reel it's mm -hmm. like this consensus reality is like a thick film that that keeps us from seeing outside the known and a child yes. doesn't see that kind of consensus they they see uniquely and can bring forth a great realizations through yeah, their they, perceptions. They haven't had the limitations placed in their in their brain. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So, um, oh, this is great. And so, I wanted to. Move, so, as we are talking about this, I, I would love to move into. Uh, kind of where we're at, at right now, which is, in my opinion, the repression of our, our language in general and how it's even becoming, uh, we're becoming more oblivious to what's happening and, and the language that we are taking in on a daily basis with media and all the information that's out there and the information age. We're supposedly supposed to be smarter because we're getting all this new information this information all, all so much, you know, like we should be smarter, right? But um, so much of it is uh, programmed in a way to um, to have us behave in a certain way as well. And, and there's also the idea of double speak, which is an interesting term, <laughs> but it's being used a whole bunch. And, and it's so to me, double speak is really confusing because you're saying something, but there's another energy that's to the words that you're saying. Like you have, so what you're actually saying and then you infuse an, a different energy into what you're saying so that people don't actually know what you're saying. Does that make sense? Yes. And, and I've yeah. also thought of it as backward talk and backward the way talk, ballot yeah. initiatives are written is definitely double speak. Uh, vote, <laughs> yeah. vote yes if you disagree. Vote <laughs> no if you agree. Oh, you know, try to keep yes. that one straight. Oh, and God. and terminology like defund the police somebody railroaded that phrase through and people just picked it up and that it doesn't mean defund the police no. a better uh <laughs> equally catchy phrase would have been reallocate resources yes that because no that's what they're would, wanting to do really exactly yeah. it's not yeah. you know so this, I think, was purposefully seeded into the consciousness and then given a lot of traction so that um, there would only be pushback. And similarly, the right to life. It's not about the right to life. It's right. about the right to, you know, to control women and their decisions. It's like, I, I worked in the 70s, I worked for a husband and wife who were NATO advisors. And I remember transcribing a speech by a German general. So this is 1970s. And he said, you know, we've got to do something about this anti-baby pill, because what about the armies of the 90s? If women stop having babies, 
who do we use for cannon fodder? So the idea that women shouldn't decide, you know, yeah. that the means to production of humanity shouldn't be left in the hands of a lowly woman to decide <laughs> yes or no, and that every fertilized egg must come to fruition because of, right. you know, the right to life. Well, if there was a real desire <laughs> to support life, then the woman would be supported with nutritionally dense uh, foods and guidance and yes. um, supplements. And she and her child would be given the means to see this child thrive. But it's not about that at all. So mm -hmm. calling it the right to life is a, a total, total double speak. And it's a lie. And Dr. Mercola had uh, a series of of four or five words whose meaning had been changed. Um, immuni uh, herd immunity, oh, I yeah. have something to say about herd that. Immunity. Yeah, <laughs> It used to mean, you know, people being immune. Now it means only everyone having the vaccination. Yeah, well, Miriam it used Webster to mean- Webster evidently changed it. Yeah, and that that's to me crazy because it I've always known it and I've I've known this for years because I always been I've been studying health for a long time and uh it it means people who have innate immunity which are the younger people um you know they they get the virus then they they build immunity to it or they don't you know it sometimes they get it they don't have any symptoms you know or they just get through it really quickly but their innate immunity is what protects the older people from the virus because it makes the virus less uh, risky. It, it really uh, waters it down, so to speak. So then when the vari variants come, then, you're, then the natural, the innate immunity has a variability in it to, to be able to, you know, to fight off all the variants as well. So it's got more variability then, um, and it was called herd immunity because for that reason, because when most of the people are exposed and they have the immunity to fight it off, um, the virus itself, then the older people will, uh, you know, they'll benefit from it because they won't, um, because by the time the virus gets to the older p people, it's much weaker. So that's the idea of herd immunity. But what they have done, they have changed the, the definition to support the vaccines. And so, um, you know, because of that, now they're saying the vaccines provide the so-called innate immunity, which is not even a thing. So because, yeah. you know, with the vaccines, it's, it's like a one trick pony, basically. So, uh, you know, it's not going to morph and, and it, you know, it's not going to be like your magical immunity, which is what I call it. So your immunity is very magical. There's so many levels to it. And so I could talk about that all day, but yes, they have changed the definition of some medical terms. And during this whole this time that we've been in the, uh, you know, lockdown dur during the um, the pandemic, uh, they have changed some some definitions, also of uh, a case study too, and that they changed the definition of that during um, the, during that time, and and I think it's be you know, if, uh, it's obvious to me it's because it serves the purpose of what they are trying to accomplish, right? Yes. But not, it's not as obvious to everybody, so. Um, so that's, it was frustrating to, for me to watch that happen in real time. Yeah. Yes. To see the manipulation of language to manipulate people. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I mean, it's, it's, I guess you can change the wording and the definition, but at the same time, it's like, but this is still happening a certain way and it's not happening the way you're saying it happens. So, yes. You know, it's like, okay, but I guess if people start believing it's happening that way, then maybe that's people's now new reality, I suppose, right? Yes. If you have enough minds concentrated on the same um, make-believe, then you can manifest it. Yes. To that's a certain words degree. words are powerful. Yeah. <laughs> and people know <laughs> that. People that are, you know, that are uh, kind of, I guess... I don't even know who these people are, but you know, people who are putting this information out, they know, I, I believe they do know the power of words. They know what they can yes. do with that. Yeah. Well, in Orwell, people talk about this as Orwellian times, and he talked about the double speak, saying one thing meaning another. 
and and how pernicious it is. And he he said politics corrupts language and language once corrupted has corrupting real world influence, but we can start uh, bringing about the cha changes by starting at the verbal end. And the, the statement I read to you a little bit ago by the author Philip K. Dick, he said the basic tool for the manipulation of reality is the manipulation of words. Mm. If you control the meaning of words, you control the people who must use those words. And yeah, gosh, there are didn't so many Plato say it have a similar uh, a, a quote to that as well. I think he, I, I feel like I remember hearing something very similar to you and I, I Oh, go ahead. Well, I don't. I don't know one from Plato. I do know. Um, I think Plato was the scribe for Socrates, right. and okay, and and uh, so he quotes Socrates as saying um, in Phaedo, P H A E D O. You may be sure, dear Crito, that inaccurate language is not only in itself a mistake, it implants evil in men's souls. Yes. So you have less, you have a, a loss of integrity there because when you're, you know, when, if your word's supposed to be impeccable, then, yes. you know, what you say, you, you don't take action with that, those words in the same way then you then we then there's no integrity in that and so uh <laughs> it can be that can be very malicious in my opinion and it's been demonstrated oh, absolutely yeah absolutely and if i can find a quote by a novelist lindsay clark he says essentially we're making the world up out of uh, words and stories all the time he says realists doubt that but to be a realist simply means settling for one of the meaner fictions of our time <laughs> i truly <laughs> believe that to be <laughs> Because, you know, the reality of it is, is you can settle for any reality you'd like. I mean, there's so many different realities out there to choose from. But, um, yeah, that's an interesting, that that is, yeah, because it always seems like the worst option. Like, yeah, I'm a realist and I have the worst. The right. And that boring. means everything is garbage. Yeah. Everything is horrible because <laughs> human right. nature is harm horrible. Uh, I, I read a fabulous book, I think I mentioned to you, called Humankind, A Hopeful History, about these opposed by Rutger Bregman. And it's about the opposing view of humanity. And the dominant view is that we are by nature savages mm. and only the yeah. thin veneer of civilization keeps us from tearing each other apart but rousseau and and that that is the dominant paradigm uh this is such a, a fantastic book human kind by rutger bregman he says the contrasting view is uh, rousseau's view which is that what turns us into savages is civilization. Mm. By nature, we are sharing beings. We are cooperative beings. And that's our true nature. Absolutely. So just before we go. Yes. I mean, it's, uh, and he gives so many fascinating descriptions. And then he talks about what power does to people. And he says there's an understanding of something called acquired sociopathy, which I believe scientists may be first identified, if I'm remembering correctly, when uh, someone in uh, the 1800s, 19th century had some kind of brain injury that totally altered his personality into from a kind cooperative person to a mean aggressive person oh, wow. and and that people when they acquire power also act as if they're brain damaged in that way with acquired sociopathy and so 
this term predatory capitalism, which I looked up and it said cultural acceptance of aggression and domination as the natural economic way. I mean, and, and that is this dominant idea of uh, acquired sociopathy, where the only thing that matters is that the people uh, get more money, the people in charge of whatever something is, acquire more money. Doesn't matter if it's destroying other people's lives or if it is destroying the planet, as long as, you know, the people in charge are getting money. So that's that's um that's the paradigm we've been living under and Absolutely. that's that's what we can change and and like um orwell said we can begin by making changes at the verbal end i yeah i love that and that's it's so and it, it's being used to advertise pharmaceuticals and this yes. new vaccine to everybody you know it's like wow i i <laughs> Now it's creeping into our health, you know, not only. So, uh, you know, the whole one of the reasons I've, I've talked talked to you about this, Laurel, is um, I wrote the book is because I wanted to bring this view of the glass half full instead of empty, because <laughs> that's a, that's a con that's default. That's what we what, what we're taught when we're kids in school, like, oh, the glass is always half empty, you know, like you're living in this terrible place. And. I would love for you to expand on the pleasure principle because that's something I want it. That's a viewpoint I want to share more with people as well. And the things I've written about and how we can really choose the reality we'd like to be in based upon how we want to, how we want to experience life. Right. So, yes. I mean, it, you know, you can either choose to do it through suffering and, and really, you know, um, I guess, hate yourself, or you can learn how to love yourself and see the beauty and the grace and the synchronicities in life and, and, um, you know, go through life in a more pleasurable way. So, um, please share, uh, the, I heard you talking about the pleasure, pleasure principle and I really loved what you said about it. Well, thank you so much. Um, Sigmund Freud talked about the pleasure principle and it was all around like the first chakra, <laughs> you know, <laughs> the, where the greatest pleasure came from. So it was the anus, the genitals and the mouth. Right. And that everything that motivated people was the pleasure principle. And I believe so many of these ideas are correct if you get them on the right dimension. <laughs> but <laughs> and one of my little good puns point. is, <laughs> yes, uh, confusing dimensions creates dementia. So that is so true, literally, because I, I mean, people, yeah, I, I, sometimes people think they are in another dimension and they get they get kind of in between. Right. Have you have you? seen that before with people well no share share what you mean well uh yeah people like my grandmother is a, a good example like she started seeing people who weren't there but who she was familiar with that may have passed and um right before she was passing you know like but she had had some a little bit of dementia um uh -huh. at towards the, the very very end and, like she was starting to get into that but it was like she was I think it was a little bit more of she was um, kind of one foot in one dimension, one foot in the other kind of thing. You know, she was kind of in between um, instead of in one or the other. Yes. And whether she was aware of it or not, I don't know. But but I, I believe that sometimes that happens when people are getting ready to pass. Yes. Well, I think it also happens when you know just in everyday life yes. um, for instance the the desire for sweetness in life uh people try to consume more and more sweets in order to feel and taste sweetness and we speak about sugar substitutes but i believe that sugar itself is a substitute <laughs> that the sweetness of mm -hmm. spirit, the sweetness of love, you can even taste it on the back of your tongue at times. And, and 
similarly, the um, desire to feel wealthy, um, people and, and, and abundant people try to get more and more physical material wealth. And yet that too becomes an addiction because as Bernie Madoff demonstrated, there's never enough of that which can never satisfy. So if you're looking to be enriched by material substances, you'll become <laughs> demented um, trying to get more and more and more. And, and, and Jeffrey Epstein, so many examples of people who were seeking the highest experiences were capable of having through material goods and substances. Mm -hmm. Or we even call alcoholic beverages, we call them spirits, because mm -hmm. we're looking for something that takes us out of the uh, noise in the you know conscious mind into a um, a space that is beyond ourselves that is transcendent, and again looking for a spiritual experience on the material plane, your behavior is essentially demented because it is destructive to you and it can be destructive to other people. Whereas to achieve it on the dimension that deeply and truly enriches, everybody benefits. And I love that so way of looking at it. Yeah. And well and and it's so true. They've even done brain scans and discovered that altruism acts of kindness stimulate the same areas of the brain as sugar and cocaine. Oh, wow. That's so incredible. If you, yeah. It is. So there are natural ways that we can express that can put us in a place of perpetual bliss and give us the resilience to ride the ups and downs of the challenges in our lives with greater equanimity and composure. And so I have said that I think Freud was correct, that everything is based on the pleasure principle. Um, also because I read a statement in a book called The Phenomenon of Man by Teilhard de Chardin when I was 20. And he said, if there wasn't the impulse toward union between cells, love couldn't appear in harmonized form between mm. us. So yeah. I think of love, this magnetic force, I call it glucose. <laughs> it's, the, <laughs> it's the sweetness that attracts us to others and, and, and may bind us with others. Glucose and, and is such a bad universes. word right now. <laughs> Yeah. I'm well, sorry, I didn't glucose. mean to cut you off on that last No, part. that's okay. But glucose is. Yes. So a certain word to be tuned up if you just tune up glucose to glue close and you realize that love is the sweetness <laughs> that brings us close together that causes cells to come into union with each other and mm -hmm. universes, planets. And so the more refined we become in, in um our tastes, the more we elevate our consciousness, the more we recognize that pleasure comes from human kindness. And <laughs> we, we feed ourselves with the sweetness we extend to others. And kindness is the honey of being. So I like to make the point that, you know, we can, it's not just, you know, the, um, so funny and uh, people people consider sex the greatest pleasure you can have and yet they swear at each other you know fuck you <laughs> instead of <laughs> as if that's a horrible thing mm. instead of you know maybe get celibate you know instead of get fucked yeah but, that's another double speak thing right <laughs> it is it's like huh like, i thought what? fucking was fun <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. And we're we're getting mixed messages here, right? <laughs> all the time. Yeah. And yet 
we can have intercourse with everyone we meet through acts of loving kindness. Mm. And, and with those acts of loving kindness, we're stimulating the pleasure centers in our brain, as well as, as giving something to someone else that expands their heart, which they then share like, you know, a pebble in the pond, they share it where they go because their heart feels light. And that's our natural condition is that sweetness and that light of spirit and the honey of being. Oh, that's so beautiful. I love that so much. I love that so much. And <laughs> it's true. It, that's another type of intercourse, as you say, because you can yes. connect with people on, on deep levels, even just like in uh, one single interaction you have with them in the course of a day, you know? Um, yes, exactly. You know. And the word smiles, <laughs> it's the S, which is a symbol for transformation in front of miles. You're, <laughs> you're doing a transformative act that can travel miles ah. beyond your, you know, across the world. Of course, now so many are masked. So you can't, you have to smile through your eyes. <laughs> yes, you do. that's a, that's an art right there. Yeah. So I, I know, and that, that is, I think what brought about a lot of the anxiety um, uh, for people, they couldn't see sm people smiling or having any kind of, you know, uh, facial expression, which I think is important to connect with when you, when you pass someone by, you know? Yes. But, um, but anyway, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Laurel. This was incredible. I, I always love spending time with you. You you are just you definitely walk the talk, so to speak. Uh, in <laughs> you are just Thank really you. is an incredible person. Um, to just to be in your energy is is so nice. So thanks for coming on today. And uh, please leave my listeners with uh, ways to get in contact with you if they and and what you're offering. I know I'm, we're just finishing up this the sacred rights uh, class that I'm loving so much, and I'm definitely signing up for the next one. Uh, and I think you have this pretty regularly, right? And and yes. please share other offerings you 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 have coming up. Thank you. I will. <laughs> so I do. Well, I just have to squeeze in a little joke I heard when oh, I was a young person <laughs> which is what's a, a four letter word for intercourse that ends with K <laughs> and the answer is talk <laughs> talk <laughs> so, that's so great and, oh my god yeah. <laughs> everything is so obvious yeah. and um, yeah. I just share how to become aware of the obvious in language and it's extremely entertaining and informing so I do hold sacred rights creative circles and we limit I usually limit the part, number of participants to five in a group this time we we've done six but and expanded the time and this is opportunities for people to uh, work on a project and receive reflections and support and encouragement and offer the same to others very fun I do it um, four week classes and I hold them every month and everyone who signs up also um, has a complimentary conversation with me if they wish and I've spent many years editing books and um, for a lot of thought leaders not doing that so much working on my own but anyway my own material I have a huge body of work only a, a small amount of which has I've published so far so where to find out about me is wordmagicglobal.com. There's podcasts and um, all fun uh, announcements and blogs. And you also will receive my free ebook as a subscriber, which is called The Book of E, a book of alphabet alchemy. And so I, I believe it's really fun. And you'll also hear the announcement. I will soon have an animation of a piece I wrote in the 90s called Esoterica by Laurel Erica, the definitive exegesis of the letter S in verse. And it's a humorous piece. Exegesis is usually used uh, 
as, as a, like in-depth exploration of the meaning of a biblical passage, but I did it on the letter S alone oh. and it's in verse and it's a lot of fun and it will be a book as well as an animation and that will be coming sometime soon, I cool. hope. Did you find and a graphic designer? Do you need to? I did. <laughs> okay, I, cool. <laughs> oh yes, I do, I do. All right. And so the animation will be done in June. Uh, he's also done, um, Thank you for asking. He's also done images and the book is, is needs a little more work, but it will soon be there. And my goodness, I have so much material and I would like to put them out like individual poems as golden books for awakened and awakening souls. And thank you. I mean, the work is, is so much fun and each one being illustrated. And if people would like to participate in assisting me in having the resources to be able to do that, I have a Patreon site and it's patreon.com word magic global. I also Wonderful. share a thank you, a four part <laughs> word magic word shop not sure quite when I'm going to do it again live because I'm working right now on creating an evergreen course and um, that people can purchase and use at their own pace and then participate in a, 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 a Facebook or Zoom conversation with me. So I think that's about it. Wonderful. Thank you again uh, for such a wonderful show and uh, experience today, Laurel. And I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing you again soon. Yes, thank you. Me okay. too. I'm very eager for our next time <laughs> together. <laughs> Bye-bye.